I'll just not talk and just let them hit buttons. No, just kidding. We good? <laughs> good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. We are happy that you're joining us from home as well. For those of you that are joining us from home, hopefully you saw on Facebook this morning and Instagram as well that um, following this morning's message, we'll be taking communion together as part of our gathering. And we just want to invite you to grab whatever you might have in your home. Um, communion and that process of it, it's not about what it is that you're eating, it's the symbolism of it. And so, I mean, saltines, Ritz, goldfish, Goldfish. I don't know. Some people feel very differently about that, and so uh, we'll give freedom to anyone who wants it. That's all I'll say about that. You can do wine, juice, apple juice, water. Anyway, grab whatever you might need um, if you'd like to participate in that this morning. Um, also, how do I want to say this? Because I want to make sure that I say it really well because it matters. Um, once again, the world is changing a bit. And what that looks like for us as a church and gathering together is also shifting. And we are allowed some freedoms. And um, there, you th the feelings probably are across the map on this, as they have been throughout the entire pandemic. And so what we're going to do here in regards to mask wearing is we're going to take a little bit of time and watch and see what our community does first. I was at Costco yesterday and there was a big sign that said if you are vaccinated, no need to show your card, you can take your mask off. And I was walking around and there not a single soul had a mask off. So and um, that is an indicator to me of kind of how maybe we should be wading into this in the shallow end of the pool. And whatever we do decide here at Brookview, we want to make sure that you have, and you at home that are saying, hey, maybe I want to be at church in person, we want to make sure that you have Apple ample opportunity to know what our gathering looks like here, and we don't want that to surprise you in any way, shape, or form. We are hoping that we can be gracious with each other. We're hoping that we could be patient, as you all have been so good at doing through this entire thing. Um, we are going to tread through this with the, the best way that we know how. We might make some mistakes, and so we'll say sorry in advance, but we love you, and we are thankful for you and the way that you have been community to us and to each other in the midst of all of this. So, so happy to see new people here this morning that haven't been here before. Eloise told me I could give her a hug because I'm vaccinated, so that's happening today. <laughs> you love it when I call you out, huh? Yeah, it's lovely when I do that kind of stuff. All right, I'm going to focus because I'm going to start giving some more shout-outs, like, oh, hi. You guys don't need that. Um, so here we go. Here are the announcements. I am super excited to share that we have a potential field for soccer club. Um, yeah, super exciting. We're going to do that August 2nd through the 6th. It's five days from 10.30 a.m. until noon. Um, the reality is all of the private fields in the area are booked. And so we are depending on the Edmond School District. And one of the things with them is that they have to follow the local health department and state orders. And so our gathering will need to be in compliance with all of that at the time. So we're a ways out from that. Um, and so there are some people are like, I, my kids can't do soccer club with masks on. I wouldn't be able to coach with a mask on. Some are like, hey, I wouldn't be able to do soccer club without masks. And so we're going to wait for quite some time before we say, this is how we're doing it, because we want to see what the world looks like. And so we will give about two to three weeks notice. We aren't going to have anyone pay for soccer club. We're going to just let them sign up. We will establish what our guidelines will be, and then people can choose their comfort level as to whether they want to continue with that registration or not. That goes the same for our volunteers. 
So you might in your mind go, yeah, I could do it if it was 100% masked, or I wouldn't do it, or somewhere in between all of that. We would still love to know, would you be willing, and are you considering it? And that just kind of helps us to know how to plan. It helps us to know how small we need our club to be, how much space we might need, how we, many small, small groups we could have. So the further in advance that we know from you, the greater it is. And so we're excited for this. And the woman at the Edmonds School District talked to Trevor, and she said, I just want, don't want you to be disappointed. I think it's going to be really, really small. We're like, we don't care. We get to get outside in our community and do something that we know how to do finally. We're doing it. Um, so we're excited. We don't have a lot of expectation with that outside of we want to love kids really well, and they deserve that. So um, if you can help with soccer club, two ways to respond to that. First, you can text the word soccer to the Brookview number, and that will come up maybe a little bit later. So just kind of keep note of that. Is my microphone going in and out and in and out? No? OK, it's just me. Uh, I bonked my head this morning, so I'm just probably going crazy. <laughs> Jason's like, oh, dear. OK, yeah, rain it in, girl, rain it in. All right. <laughs> cool, cool, so yeah. If you didn't hear that at home, there was a small bet going on in my family as to whether or not I would announce that I hit my head <laughs> this morning on a cabinet, and Keller won. Okay. Okay, how you can respond, though. That text number, the word soccer, send that. We will get in touch with you. Also, your online communication card at brookviewchurch.com forward slash contact. And um, there's a little check mark there on a box that you can fill out, I'm interested in soccer club. So that's not a hard commitment from you, just a, hey, I might be interested and available to do that. Um, the partnership class, a partnership class, is happening on May 22nd. Yes. Okay, May 22nd from 9 o'clock till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And that is for, number one, anyone who has never taken it before, um, but also for anyone who might be interested in what is Brookview all about. Um, I'd like to ask some questions. I'd like to hear what this whole church thing is and what your church specifically is about. Um, we would like you to come and be able to have your questions answered and to just see other people. You might be surprised at how many people are new, just like you are as well. So um, if you'd like to come to that, you can also text the word partner to the Brookview number, or you can sign up on your online communication card, and um, we'll be so excited to have you at that gathering. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, Brooklyn? All right, all right, that's it. Yeah, I know, clap for me. She's leaving, everybody. Uh, no, let me pray for us. I feel like that's like an appropriate thing to do in this moment. God, man, thank you for who you are. I thank you for this community of people that we get to do life with. I think I'm so thankful for the way that you have, um, met us in every arena of this pandemic, and you have stood in front of us, beside us, and behind us. And as we walk around in the world in a new way, and there are all sorts of um, just feelings about that, that we might have personally, but also that the people around us have, God, would you help us to be like you? Would you help us to be gracious and kind and loving and believing the best in people? Um, and just extend that to ourselves as well. Um, God, you are, you are good, and I am so thankful for that. And as Jason comes this morning, I pray, God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we wouldn't just know more about you, but, God, we would encounter you in some way, and it would compel us um, to live a little differently. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
Hey. First of all, the lady at the Edmonds School District is dead wrong about kids being interested in soccer clubs, don't you think? Yes, it's going to be packed. So if you're thinking about, hey, they won't need me, it's going to be small, I don't know if they need me to coach. Yes, we do, because the more coaches we have, the more kids we can have. Okay, if you're remotely interested, uh, we need you, and so let us know. Um, I, I know Brooklyn does a basketball camp, an overnight one every year, and we were going to get her signed up for this, and they offer a couple of them, they're all booked. So I'm like, kids are, kids are doing stuff. Okay, now, this is going to be a little bit morbid. But some say the best way to die is some kind of disease that has a timeline attached to it. So like the doctor says to you, hey, you have six months to live or you have nine months to live or whatever. Does that sound a little bit counterintuitive to you? It, it does to me. Um, it, it feels to me like, like sudden death on a beautiful day, like... You know, I'm driving down the 101 in California, and it's just gorgeous, just it's breathtaking drive, and I get so lost in the beauty that I just missed the turn, right? And the last thought I have is, Cliff, <laughs> right? Like, that might be better, but the experts, the experts say, no, no, that's not. Uh, there are many that argue that, that death with a timeline is best because then you have a few months for closure in your life. You have a few months to make things right. You have time to call up that old friend, to tie up any loose ends in your relationships, to make sure that those you love know it, to time to, to make sure that those you leave behind will be prepared for life without you. This morning, we're going to read a, a passage that is exactly that for Jesus. It's a, a portion of what scholars refer to as the upper room discourse, which is basically Jesus's parting words to his apprentices on his final night with him like prior to his execution. And this conversation actually spans four chapters, so we're jumping in right in the middle of it. But let's read Jesus's parting words to his dearest and closest friends. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." Did you notice how many times Jesus used the word remain? Remain in me. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Remain in my love. Jesus is he's like a musician that's just sort of riffing on the same theme over and over again. Like many older translations don't use the word remain, but the word what? Abide. The Greek word translated remain or abide is meno, and it just means to make your home in, to dwell in, to live from. I, I really like Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this passage from the message. This is just verses 4 to 8, but here's, here's how he paraphrases this. He says, this is the words of Jesus. He says, live in me, make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. So the final word of Jesus 
um, to, uh, to his closest friends and to us is to make our home in him, to, to abide. We are to anchor our mind and our awareness to connection with him, and we are to index our heart toward who Jesus is, and this Jesus who is always with us. We are to make our home in him and him in us. And as a result of doing that, Jesus says we will bear much fruit. So if we, if we learn to make our home in Jesus and him in us, the natural result will be fruit. So he's saying the more that I'm connected to him, the more his life will flow into me and give me power, power to live by the Holy Spirit, to experience things like the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if those things are, are, are then becoming present in me in increasing measure, it will impact the way, uh, the way that I relate to the world and the way that I relate to people. And it will enable me to live a life that truly matters, that has impact on the world around me. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I hear this and I'm like, okay, that all sounds great. The big question is, how? Right? Like for all of you that are pragmatics out there, this is where your mind goes. And I, and I love that about you, especially in the day of the iPhone and Wi-Fi and news alerts and 5G. Thank you, China. And group text threads and, and little kids and soccer practice and traffic or whatever your life is. How in the world do we slow down and live with Jesus? And this is kind of what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. We've been taking a hard look at our, our life rhythms because what I organize my attention and my schedule around, it shapes me. And so it's wise to be very intentional, to focus our attention and schedule and our spiritual rhythms sort of serve then as, as kind of like a trellis for a vine. And when you think about it, for a vine to flourish, it will need some sort of support structure. Have any of you ever grown grapes or anything on a vine? We are a city, city group of folks. Okay, so let's do this. I'll show you what it looks like. Let's, let's envision a vineyard, right? You got, your, you got, and, 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 uh, you got a structure. Uh, okay, we're city folks. Let's try this. Anyone ever been wine tasting? Oh, wait, a whole bunch of you. Are you admitting that in church right now? Like, no. You're like, some of you are like, I've never been wine tasting. Maybe your parents have. And for some of you, it's like, yeah, that's for like rich old people. Yes. Um, and here, you guys, I've realized I'm getting old because now many, many of my younger friends go wine tasting um, and they love it. Okay, so you know a little wine tasting. But, but okay, so get the picture of a vineyard in your mind's eye. And, and in a vineyard, the vines, when this is all done with intentionality, the, the vines don't just grow along the ground, right? For a, a vine to, quote, bear fruit that remains, it needs a trellis. It needs some sort of support structure to lift it off of the ground, something that creates space for it to grow and mature and flourish, and even points it in a certain direction for, for life. Okay, so you think about grapes on a vine. Is that not delicious looking? Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. So... Otherwise, a, a vine without a trellis, uh, just a wild vine out in nature, it will actually bear a fraction of the fruit that it is capable of. And the little that it does bear will be vulnerable to predators like a coyote or a rabbit, not to mention disease. Well, in the same way, for an apprentice of Jesus to abide in the vine so that that apprentice can bear much fruit, a kind of support structure to create space for a life that's organized around abiding is necessary. For a life that's like, cons that has consistent relational connectedness to Jesus. It's helpful to have some sort of support structure. Now, some of you at this point might be feeling a little bit worried. Because you came in here and you're tired, right? And so you're like, listen, Jason... Are you about to lay some kind of heavy load on me? You better not because that might break me because I'm tired and I'm overwhelmed and I just can't add all these rhythms to my life. I don't have space. 
I don't have energy. I need rest. I need quiet. I need a break from my kids. God bless them. I need a vacation. So if you are about to uh, lay a big list of to-dos on me, stop now because I can't take it. Okay, so let me, just, let me just say, that is not where we're going today. So relax. Um, what I do want is I want you to think about your current rhythms that you already have and what they're doing to you. You already have all kinds of rhythms. We all have rhythms. Odds are you have some kind of morning routine when you wake up. You have rhythms for when you sleep or when you exercise or when you don't exercise or what you do around meal times or who you spend time with, what you do in the evenings as, as you kind of wind down and then right before bed. The question is not like, do you have rhythms? It's what are your rhythms doing to you? And so if you're tired and you're worn out all the time, and if life is filled with worry and anxiety and stress and yelling or crying, then my question would be, well, are your rhythms working for you? Are your rhythms serving as a support structure that enables you to flourish? And many of you at Brookview have been giving this a ton of thought over the last several years. And I know a couple of our men's groups right now are right in the middle of giving this a ton of thought. And several of you have made a few tweaks along the way, not necessarily major things, but a few tweaks along the way that have produced something big time for you. And so you are evaluating and you're tweaking and you're abiding in Jesus and you are seeing like breakthrough levels of fruit in your life. It's really cool. But as the world opens up and many of us have sort of have this chance to hit reset, we can in some ways create new rhythms. You don't have to go back to life exactly as it was pre-COVID, right? You're free to try some new things, do some things that are different. And that's what this series has been all about. And today, as we wrap this thing up, I just want to get like insanely practical. How do you create a structure of rhythms that actually enables you to flourish? How do you get enough rest and quiet that your tank gets filled? How do you create space for relational connection to Jesus? How do you abide with Jesus in a way that actually produces fruit? Well, for the next few minutes, I just, I just want to share some ideas with you. Okay, some, what I, what I would just say are best practices for healthy abiding rhythms. Now, I am not telling you exactly what to do at all. Your life is unique. Your situation is unique, and you'll see that reflected in these. But I can give you some principles to help, okay? And the first one is this. Start where you are. When it comes to making your home in Jesus, like start where you are. Take into account all the things that are going on in, life, in your life and your, and your spiritual maturity level. I mean, when it, like, it, it is tempting, it's so tempting for us to sit in church and then some pastor that is amazingly inspirational um, says something and you go, oh man, I'm going to change everything. And you go out and you try to live like a monk or a nun the very next day, right? Like, I'm going to read the Bible for an hour a day and I'm going to pray for two hours a day and I'm going to fast once a week. No, nay, twice a week. And I'm going to go to church every week and I'm going to get into a small group. No, maybe two. And then I'm going to tattoo Jesus on my arm and then he'll literally make his home in me. <laughs> and for those of you that have, some of you have Jesus on your arm, God bless you. That's awesome. All I'm saying is, if you try to bite off more than you can chew, You'll choke on it. So start where you are, not necessarily where you want to end up over time. Start where you are. And don't feel guilt or shame or pressured by legalism. And don't let me pressure you from the stage. Just think about Jesus and his love for you and the life he wants for you. And let that motivate you to take the next step into abiding with him. And if you're like brand new to Jesus, or maybe you're not even sure about it all, then, then deciding to like pray for five hours a day for revival while naked on the roof or something, it might be a little bit aggressive, right? Not to mention inappropriate, right, Bob? Something about, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I love, I love you. I love that you just own that. Uh, it was my fantasy and you just jumped right into it. 
You guys, when I, I think about me, when I first started this whole thing, I, I like, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. And, um, and so, like, you've got to start with something you can handle. And for some of you, it might just be like, go to church more regularly. Okay, that might be the next step. Like, figure out a way to go to church more regularly. Or, or when you miss church or you can't be here or right now is not because of COVID, that's not the time. Find space to watch it online and carve that out. Maybe that's it. Uh, when I first started, like, following Jesus or being interested, that's where I started. I didn't know what else to do. So I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to go to church more regularly. I'm going to do something that's a step forward. But here's the thing. Don't try to do too much. Take into account your maturity level. And don't try to do something that's way beyond you. Like if you don't have a habit of prayer already in your life, then for heaven's sakes, don't start with two hours a day. Right? Maybe start with two minutes a day. And then you can can build from there. This is so critical. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Start where you are. Okay, second. When you decide on something to try, be specific. Right? We know this. I'm just, I'm just telling you what you already know. So you could decide, I'm going to pray more. Or you could say, I'm going to pray for two minutes after breakfast. Which one is more likely to happen? You could say, I'm going to be more spiritual. Or you could say, you know what, I'm going to figure out a way to go to church twice a month at least. You could say, I'm going to relax and rest more. Or you could say, I'm, I'm going to figure out a way to make Sundays a day of Sabbath rest for me, or whatever it might be for you. You could say, I'm, I'm going to get more fellowship. Or you could say, actually, I'm going to host a barbecue on Tuesday. If you want something actionable, you have to be specific. Okay, here's another one, really important. Think subtraction as much as addition. You, you guys, you know this, but let me just say, you can't just add on more and more and more and more, and then expect to be happy, joyful, peace, you know, flowing, and, and, and bringing joy to the world, and your family, and your spouse, right? I mean, to abide in Jesus, really, to, to be able to abide in Jesus for most, it will actually require doing less. The invitation of Jesus is one of of peace and rest, not insanity and stress. So please do not hear me saying, oh, you're already stressed out of your mind and you don't get enough sleep? Then get up an hour earlier to pray and meditate. And read through the entire New Testament every week. And oh yeah, make sure you exercise four times a week because spirituality is holistic. (laughs) Right, like that's all great stuff. I'm not discouraging any of that. But the point is, we need to slow down. We need to simplify. You're going to have to cut stuff out very likely to be able to make space for something else. You're going to have to leave room for your deepest values and your deepest desires. Before you add something, something else has got to go. So what might that be for you? Could be a really good thing. But you might need to cut it out or to cut it back for a better thing. Look, the busier and more overscheduled you are to start with, the more your, your rhythms that you work in are going to need to include things like rest and silence, maybe some solitude, maybe Sabbath, maybe extra sleep. Many of us are so busy, we have almost no unstructured time. I mean, the day is mapped out from wake up till bedtime. Virtually every minute of the day is scheduled with something. And so what happens then is if we do stumble upon some unstructured time, often it's just swallowed up by the, by the digital carnivore. Right? You know what I mean? Like we find a rare moment of quiet. And whether it's like 40 minutes long or four minutes long, what we do is we reach for our phone and we get sucked right into the rabbit hole. Of course... I'm not saying, okay, it's, it's awful, it's sinful, terrible, will destroy your life to stay up late watching Netflix. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with seeing your cousin on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. But here's the thing to keep in mind. Very few of us get done binge watching the latest show on Netflix for like four hours and staying up till two in the morning or scrolling through Instagram for 45 minutes and then come out of that and say, I just feel so aware of God right now. 
I feel so happy. I feel so content with how God made my body. I feel really great about who I am. I feel content with my life. I don't wish I had more money or wish I was prettier or more successful or cooler. I just feel like, pinch me, man. My life is amazing. (laughs) Right? And I can't wait to wake up in the morning because I just have so much to contribute to the world with joyful creativity and generosity. Does Jack Bauer, you know, a couple of, a couple of Jack Bowers do that to you? I mean, usually when, when we get mindlessly swallowed up by the digital carnivore, we come away feeling like insecure, discontent, more tired. And we just feel like, you know, or, or just like, dang, I stayed up way too late again, and now sh- I'm going to be exhausted at work tomorrow. By the way, after last week's message on um, digital distraction, In my online groups on Wednesday night, I asked, hey, you know, we kind of ended with, what's what's getting way too much of your attention these days? First question. Second question is, what isn't getting enough of it? And then the third was, is there a tangible way to kind of swap one for the other? Okay, and one young woman decided to limit her time on TikTok to 20 minutes a day. Do you guys know you can do that with your apps? You can set limits on them. And you can set a limit for just like one app or you could group several apps together and say, We're gonna, I'm going to combine all these and all of these, is the limit is two hours a day or whatever. Then you have a code for it. Maybe you have to ask somebody's permission in your life to break the code so that if you actually have to use it for some good reason or whatever. Okay, your phone will do that for you. Your smartphone is pretty smart. Um, so this young woman set a daily limit of 20 minutes for TikTok. 20 minutes. And she decided that if she reaches her limit, then she will follow that up with three minutes of prayer. I don't know if that's a soul cleansing or what, like. (laughs) But she's like, if I actually have enough time to spend 20 minutes on TikTok, I probably have three minutes to pray. So this is how I'm going to do this for this next season of my life. And I found that to be very proactive. I found it to be... um, thoughtful. I found it to be wise. And I would never want to call somebody out like what happens in group stays in group. I would not want to embarrass this person. So I won't like, but her initials are (laughs) Kate Huguenin. Yeah. So, okay. So her plan is to limit something that steals her attention And then if she has enough time to spend 20 minutes on that app, she she has three minutes to pray. Now, can we just be honest? This is not going to turn her into Mother Teresa. (laughs) Okay, but I really really love this step because it meets all the criteria we've talked about already. It's bite-size, it's specific, and it's more about subtraction than it is addition. Like, you can't just keep adding more and more and more. And if you're constantly tired and and stressed and overwhelmed, odds are it would be really helpful for you to subtract something. So before you even think about addition, you have to think subtraction. Like, if you have three kids and they're all doing three sports right now, like, what is that doing to your family? What's that doing to your marriage? What is that doing to your soul, right? Right? And then you're like, yeah, now I need to pray for an hour a day. Oh, I don't know how many. Like, are you kidding me? Think subtraction before you think addition. Okay, and that leads me into another one. Factor in your season of life. You you have a lot of demands on your time that are immovable. Like if you have three toddlers at home right now, now or you're caring for an aging parent or your spouse is having major health issues or you're a single parent who works full time, or you're working full-time, plus you're taking, like, like, you know, college classes online or whatever, that's, that's a very different scenario than the person who just retired. Or a college student whose parents are completely paying for school and they don't need to work. Just college, go to school. That's all that, all that there is. Several years ago, um, Jen and I had dinner with some old college friends of mine, um, a couple that had gotten married, and by this point, they had had a few kids. So we're having dinner, and the, the woman says, she's now a wife and a mother of three, she says, man, she looks at me, and now I'm not a pastor yet, I'm just Jason, okay? And she's like, I feel really guilty about my spiritual life. And so I said, well, what do you mean? 
She's like, well, you remember when we were all up at Western? I just felt so connected to Jesus. My prayer life, my time in the Word, like I'd go to Chuckanut Drive and I would have like two-hour quiet times, like regularly, just looking out over the water and reading Scripture and I'd have prayer. And she was right, man. When she was in college, she had class three hours a day. And she had the entire rest of the day to figure out how to do a couple hours of homework. Some of you are in college, you're like, I'm so busy. If you're not working like 30 hours a week on top of it, shut up. Get out of college, get married, pump out a few kids, and then tell me about busy. <laughs> okay, so, so she's just like, yeah, I, got, you know, I have my three hours of class. I got a couple of hours of homework to do. Other than that, her parents paid for school, which was awesome, very cool. No dot job. She just had this insane amount of flexible time, right? So she would spend hours in scripture and in prayer, and she went to church every Sunday. And then she went to the huge college group that we had on Tuesdays. And then she had a small group with other college students on Thursdays. And she was just surrounded by other people that loved Jesus and talked about Jesus all the time. So that night at dinner, she was in a very different season of life. Three kids, two preschoolers, owned a house, had all the responsibilities of caring for a house. She had very little adult conversation during the day, right? She had very little time that wasn't interrupted every five minutes, like this just wave of demands being thrown at her all the time. And yet she was expecting to somehow maintain her old college rhythms in this other season of life. That's insane, And so she's feeling inadequate, and she's feeling guilty, and she's feeling ashamed, and she's feeling embarrassed. You guys, she was neglecting to factor in just the reality of a new season of life. So here's what I want to say. For goodness sake, don't compare your spiritual life to the spiritual life of someone that's in a different season. Right? And, 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 and if you're in a more demanding season of life right now, then don't compare yourself to yourself in some previous season. Because you will need regular abiding rhythms that actually work for the season of life you happen to be in right now. Two and a half hours of quiet time a day is not going to work for many of you. Jesus is okay with that. Your rhythms will need to flex as you adapt and as your seasons of life change. If you get married, they will change. If you have a baby, they will change. If your kid moves out, they will change. If you go through a crisis, they will, they will change. If you have a revelation before God, they will change. And it's right that your rhythms are in flux and they change and they adapt because you change. To be human is, is dynamic. It's not static. So when it comes to rhythms, you have to always, always, always revisit, 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 and just ask with honesty, are my rhythms still working for me? Are, are they helping me keep my soul before Jesus well? Are they enabling me to, to rest and to become a person of peace? Okay, just a couple more. Next one. Factor in your personality. I, this is basic stuff, but if, if, you're like, if you're like hyper introverted, don't feel guilty about that. Like, carve out lots of time to just sit before God. Like, paint a mural on your wall. If you're renting, ask your landlord first. Um, Just carve out lots of time to sit before God. And then when you do come visit the rest of us, like once a month, um, then you will come with wisdom and with calm. On the flip side, if you're over-the-top extroverted, don't feel bad about that. Carve out all sorts of time to be with other people, family, friends. All of, if, you, if you connect with God through nature, then go hiking a lot or go kayaking or whatever you do to get out in nature. If it's through poetry, then do a lot of writing. Factor in your personality. Do this in a way that aligns with who you are. Don't hold yourself up to some arbitrary ideal that isn't a good fit for you. Craft your rhythms in a way that is just the real you before God. And again, if you're an extrovert, I just want to say, if you're an extrovert, I want to warn you, too much silence and solitude will dry up your soul. So be wise. 
Craft your spiritual practices to, to many of them to be in community with other people. Not all of them, but many of them. If you're introverted, you're going to have to carve out more alone time. But either way, be wise about what makes you come most alive. Now, I want to say, that does not mean you only ever do spiritual practices that are super easy. Okay, and that leads to the next one. You need to balance easy with hard. Some, some practices that produce great things, they don't come easily to us. And so if we try it once and go, it didn't do anything for me. Well, yeah. I mean, for, like the, the practice of journaling was always a struggle for me. It was always a struggle for me. But about five years ago, I got into a group that required it. And over time, it has developed into this life-giving staple for me. But I had to embrace something hard and then stay with it for a long period of time. Okay, however, at the same time, here's what I will say. I had lots of other practices that were easy. I didn't make every spiritual practice this grueling, grit-your-teeth kind of hard sort of spiritual practice. That would have been stupid. So I would, I would do things that were really easy for me. I would listen to a ton of, of worship music when I was driving or when I was working out. Why? Because I love that, and it helps me to connect with Jesus, but it's not a lot of extra work. It's just like dessert, man. comes easy. Uh, for me, I've been in, in life groups and ID groups, and you guys, that comes easy to me. Talking about Jesus, talking about life with other people, talking about spiritual stuff with others, that comes really easy to me. It's life-giving. For others of you, the journaling part, you're like, oh, I'd totally nail that. But being in groups with other people, that's challenging. Here's the thing. Most of your spiritual rhythms should be things that are easy. And they should be things that you look forward to. Things that just sort of come naturally to you. So if you adopt a bunch of abiding kind of rhythms that are all hard at the same time, it is going to drain you. So watch out for that. Okay, but if you only ever do stuff that's super easy, you can miss out on things that Jesus has for you that might be really, really rich in the end. Okay, last one. When you establish abiding rhythms, be holistic. Um, Jesus said that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, meaning with all that we are, with our whole life. And really, the downside to calling spiritual disciplines spiritual disciplines is that it's really easy to forget on some level that actually everything is a spiritual discipline. Like scrolling on Insta is a spiritual discipline. Watching Netflix is a spiritual discipline. Going to 24-hour fitness is a spiritual discipline. Sleeping in is a spiritual discipline. Meaning everything that we do, it, it does something to form our spirit, our, our inner man or woman, whether it's formation or deformation, whether it makes us more like Jesus or less, more loving and peaceful or more angry, anxious, and unhappy. Either way, at some level, everything we do is a spiritual discipline. So it's our goal as followers of Jesus to learn more and more how to lay all of it before the throne of God, to worship him in the language of Romans 12 as living sacrifices. Our whole life and just this expression of worship toward God. And I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of Paul in Romans chapter 12. He writes, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your every, everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Now, on one hand, it's, it's important to build in things like scripture and prayer and church, but if we think of the rest of life then as unspiritual, we're missing out, because Jesus wants us to abide with him through, through all of it. So hiking, resting, working out, golfing, hunting, crafting, gardening. Like one guy in my men's group just this week, he's he's very serious about working out. It's like this big rhythm in his life, and he does it in community, uh, which is very cool. So he meets his friends at the gym, and they get after it, okay? But this week, he sensed an invitation from God that kind of went like this. Hey, include me in that with you. 
I'm for it. I'm for you taking care of your body. I'm for you spending time with your friends. Find a way to abide in me while you do it. It's a really good thing and not an unspiritual thing at all. So become aware of my presence as you go about it. So this guy decided he was going to do something simple. He's like, you know what? When I pull up in my car at the gym, I'm just going to stop before I go and I'm going to pray. Not a two-hour prayer that takes over his entire time of working out. Just like a 30-second or one-minute prayer. And, and that's something that God invited him into that time. And, and so he, he's like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite God into that time with me and remind. And I just want to be reminded of God's presence and God's love for me. So he decided he'll just ask God to open doors to meaningful conversations with the people that he's working out while he's doing that and just have a great time with his friends in a way that's enriching for everybody. It's a small tweak. But I honestly think with as much as this guy works out and he's jacked, uh, (laughs) this could produce much fruit in his life over time. So yes, we, we need prayer and we need scripture and we need community with other followers of Jesus to really grow and flourish. And these are foundational building blocks. But, but most of life, can we just admit, is not these things. So learning to abide everywhere, th- this is actually what thoroughly transforms us over time. And this is what produces this huge amount of fruit. And here's the thing. This is not about adding more stuff to your plate. It's about increasing your awareness of God's presence and his pleasure with you. It's about living your whole life and learning to live your whole life in relationship with him. So often when we think about abiding our spiritual disciplines, there's something in us that just resists immediately. Because we we feel like, you know what, I'm just too tired to add anything more to my busy life. But if we're doing this in a healthy way, what it produces in us is rest and energy. It produces peace and life and joy. So here's the thing about a trellis with grapes in a vineyard. A trellis supports the vine from underneath. It doesn't lay on top of it, crushing it. Okay, so the the people that encountered Jesus on the street in his day, they knew all about a kind of religion that crushes people. Right, A legalistic spirituality that causes guilt and shame and fatigue. And it was to those people and to us that Jesus gently says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this because it feels similar, but it, it grabs me in a different way. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I don't know about you, I'm in for that. The invitation of Jesus is for you to live freely and lightly in union with him, which means the principles that I just shared with you are not rules. They're principles that are wise to consider But you have so much freedom in how you actually walk with Jesus. Your system should ultimately be measured by what it produces in you. Like, Don't compare yourself to someone else and don't feel guilt and don't feel shame. But always be asking, what are my rhythms producing in me? Are they leading to love and joy and peace and self-control? Or are they leading to stress and anger and burnout? Or maybe like just purposelessness and emptiness? Your system is only as good as what it's producing in you. I don't care what your system is if it's not producing the fruit in you. And so to close, I just want all of us to think about our rhythms. What are your actual rhythms right now? What are your current rhythms? And the question is not, are they committed to God enough? Is Jesus impressed with me? 
Is everybody around the church impressed with me? Is my neighbor impressed with me? Is my dad impressed with me? Right? Doesn't matter. The, the, the better question is, what are they producing in you? What are they producing in you? And there's a, there's a saying that gets used a lot in the business world, like when consultants come into a, a business to assess the situation. Um, and they talk about this with business leaders all the time. And I think this applies very well to our thinking about rhythms. And it's, here's the saying. Your system is perfectly designed to give you the results you are getting. Your system is perfectly designed to give you the results that you are getting. Now, when you apply that logic to your spiritual formation or your emotional health or your relationship with Jesus or your relationship with other people, if the results that you are getting are, man, I, I live with just constant low-grade anxiety, I, or I hate how I just get sucked into my phone, or I, I don't like how far I feel from God, or I don't like how... You know, I know a lot of people, but I don't feel much depth in my relationships with them. Or I feel weird about my body all the time. Or I feel uncomfortable in my own skin. Or I'm tired all the time and I just can't seem to find quality rest. Then the odds are that something about the system of your day-to-day -day life or my day-to-day -day life is off kilter. It's been said that our, our life is the byproduct of our lifestyle. And this is, this is why Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus isn't just the truth. He isn't just the Bible or theology. Jesus is a way. I've heard it said kind of in a memorable way that it's the way of Jesus wedded to the truth of Jesus that brings out the life of Jesus. And so to close, I just, I just invite you guys to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I just want to read the words of Jesus over you from the message. And this is John 15, 1 to 8 again. His parting words to his apprentices. Let these words speak to you. It says, I am the real vine, and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. And every branch that is grape-bearing, he prunes back so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me. Make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you are joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is like dead wood gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my Father shows who he is when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. You can open your eyes. This morning, you guys, we're going we're gonna to take communion. We haven't done this for a long time. Um, and when you think about it, communion is a kind of rhythm. Right? It's a practice that helps us engage our mind to focus our gaze on Jesus for a moment. And this is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. How are we going to do this this morning? Um, those of you that normally go to Brookview, you know we usually have like a, an altar up kind of front and you can come up and at any time as we're worshiping, when it, makes, when it feels right to you, you can come up and kneel and pray and then take the elements. And that's, we don't have that in this time of COVID. So if you're wanting that kind of an experience, I would just encourage you to kneel at your chair for a moment, to sit and to pray and then kneel at your chair when that makes sense and you can take the elements. And by the way, those are all prepackaged for you. You take off the, the first outer layer and you get a wafer. 
and then you take off the second layer and you get the juice. That's how that works. So what we're going to do is, and for those of you online, whatever elements you have, they work. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to sing a few worship songs, and at any point that you want to, where it makes sense for you, just invite you to take communion. Spend this time with Jesus and fix your gaze on him. <laughs>